Um, maybe we should just kind of start off with questions you might have regarding what we did this morning in lab. If there's anything that you didn't have a chance to ask about or wanted clarification on? Anything in lab? Okay, how about um, respiratory system, blood? Um, maybe you haven't started the blood chapter yet, so maybe more questions on, on, on respiratory system or even muscular, we can talk about anything you'd like. How far have you gotten into the respiratory system? I've got the respiratory and blood PowerPoints pulled up here. We can reference any of those if you would like. So like quick question about like the muscles, so, like for like lecture, we stopped like right before like smooth muscle and like cardiac muscle. Um, so like, is that gonna be on like the exam then? Well, we didn't quiz you over smoother cardiac, but that doesn't mean we're not including that part of the chapter. Okay. Where, where we stopped um, in the uh, muscular chapter, which was nine, I can pull that up here, just so everybody's aware of what you're asking. So let me share my screen. So here's the uh, chapter nine PowerPoint. Um, and so I think we stopped the quiz material probably somewhere I don't see, I forget what section it was. I don't know if we included fast twitch and slow twitch fibers. Yeah, we did. Okay, so that was part of that section. Um, 9.3, yeah. So 9.4, which is really a relatively short section. There's only like um, maybe a page. That got into smooth muscle fibers both multi-unit and visceral smooth muscle. That's the two major types of smooth muscle. And, um, and I, you know, I talk about those and give you some examples of that. We compare and contrast smooth with skeletal. We find that there are some similarities, but there's also some differences. <clears throat> and then there is a rather short section, section 9.5. Literally, it's only about five paragraphs that is devoted to cardiac muscle. So yes, that's, that's where we would end uh, chapter nine. This is the actual last slide where we kind of throw all the three of them on the table. And so you can kind of see them compared to one another and differences and just a nice kind of a summary table. Uh, where we pick up with um, learning the individual muscle groups where they talk a little bit about um, levers, you know, that's where you can end for the lecture. Yeah. Other other questions, comments? Okay. Well, while we're talking about um, things that will be on future quizzes and exams, I see on our um, Oh goodness, on our syllabus or schedule, it says um, it lists what will be on the lecture three exam, like what chapters, the eight, nine, 14, and 19, but lecture exam number four doesn't say which chapters it will cover. Okay, so um, let's see. 
So lecture exam three, yeah, we picked up with um, And look here, eight, nine, 14, and that includes blood, 14. So joints, muscular system, respiratory, and blood. Yeah, so the uh, fourth exam is gonna be over just two chapters, cardiovascular and lymphatic, which would be 15 and 16. Yeah, I could have easily put that on there. I'm not sure why I didn't. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, so the two chapters. For, that's for um, lecture exam four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what yeah. Would the, again, I'm sorry. I'm uh, sorry. What would it be for again? <clears throat> for chapters fourteen or fifteen and sixteen. Which is cardiovascular and lymphatic systems. I was just going to say, you know, boy, it's nice to have a, a test over just two versus three or four chapters. And we have had exams over three and four chapters, or, you know, we'll have had the third exam over the four chapters. Um, these two last chapters, cardiovascular and lymphatic, are um, cardiovascular is kind of long, and lymphatic is probably one of the more difficult conceptual chapters to understand um, because we're talking about immunity and we're talking about interactions of antibodies and antigens. We, we kind of introduced those concepts today in lab, um, antigens being those surface proteins on the red cell, right? And the antibodies in the uh, serum. Um, we're gonna talk about those things again, but in a little different context as it relates to the immune response. It's a super interesting chapter because, of course, here we are in the middle of a pandemic. So it is going to be like just a really neat chapter to kind of try to infiltrate some of the stuff we've been living through the last year plus with our immune system. So I'm not trying to say there's not a lot of cool stuff in there because there is. Um, but I would say that sometimes students find um, the lymphatic system, at least parts of it, not all of it, to be um, a little more conceptual. Some of the topics are a little more cerebral, I guess I put it. I don't know how else to describe it. So I'm not trying to scare anybody or you know anything like that. Just understand that yes, two is a few chapters, but um, we're gonna have plenty of material to, to talk about in those last two chapters. That's why we're spending like, gosh, almost uh, <clears throat> one, two, three, three and a half weeks. Well, basically three weeks on two chapters. Cardiovascular, I think I may have said to you guys, is my favorite chapter of the entire book. I just really find cardiovascular super, super, super interesting. I don't know why. I just do. And as I say, uh, I'm not trying to get you all flustered or scared or anything, um, because this is just a continuation of what we've been doing. It, it really is. You, you're into a groove, hopefully, now. You kind of know you've been through, what, integumentary, skeletal, muscular, respiratory. You're, you know, you've been through this a little now. You kind of know how the game is played. And that's huge. It really is. You, you're, you're into a rhythm, you know, hopefully, in terms of your studying and how you organize your time. And so just continue what you're doing. And, and, and uh, you know, like I said today, when I saw you guys, you know, really around the, the models, it was just really, I was excited because I love to see that. I mean, I know you guys were nervous about the quiz, but it's just so good to kind of know you're working together and you're, a, you know, trying to work to a common goal and helping each other. And that's just really what it's all about. You know, that that excitement and fun that you have with each other, that, that can be, in, you know, kind of intoxicating. I mean, I hope you find that to be a fun part of, of 
of the experience. You get to know people and you joke around, and but you're still you're still focused, and that's that's great. Study groups can just be a super way to learn stuff. It really, really can be. It can be fun and it can be a great learning tool. So are you good with the muscular system chapter? Is there anything in here that you'd like to review? How are you doing with the muscular system chapter? Anything you want me to pull up? Mm. How about respiratory? Or is my friend who went to uh, Oxford in England, she pronounced it respiratory. I used to always razz her about that. Respiratory system. I said, what? It's called respiratory. Get your English going. No. It's interesting how the Brits, uh, she was actually from Israel, but she went to school in London. Can we actually go over what we did in lab, like the blood, just because I know like once you learn something, it's best to go over it again. Do you remember sure. it? You know it sure. instead of like waiting until. Yeah, yeah. Especially the one. Oh, what was it? It was page. And think, what was it? And, the and volumes. Actually... You you said make sure you know like the volume. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was the respiratory system. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Let's let's pull that up. And we'll go right to that diagram. Um, so let me uh, stop sharing, make sure that. OK, now do you see the diagram now? Yes. That yeah. one. So this, remember, um, related to, oh, let's see, exercise, was it 46, 46 in the lab book. So I'm going to hold up to my camera in your lab book, figure 46.5. It's the very same diagram, OK? Same one. You have this in your textbook, and you have it in your lab book. And you have it on the PowerPoint. It's the same one. And so if, let's say, we had you go to the hospital and you were suffering from some respiratory issues, um, they would no doubt measure a lot of these respiratory volumes. Um, and here, of course, is the same photograph I showed you this morning. It's a, individual sitting there breathing through an apparatus. You can see him holding it there. And the technician is, is recording his responses. She's giving him instructions as to how to breathe. And then I know it's kind of hard to see, but this is likely <clears throat> got a, a pen. Uh, and it would measure his inspirations and expirations like on graph paper, you know. So imagine him when he exhales through that, the pen would go down. And when he inhales, the pen would go up on the paper. So inhalation, up, exhalation, down. I think you can kind of, kind of intuitively sort of imagine you sitting there blowing through this device or breathing through this device and the pen etching on the paper or maybe on a computer screen. And that program is then saved and it can be printed out, right? And included in his, his records for the physicians down the road or right away. Um, and that could culminate in something similar to what you see here. Now, granted, this is just all this information packed on one single slide, right? You might run a strip 
a long strip of just his title volume or other aspects of these different volumes. But we're compressing everything on just one single imaginary strip of paper, right? And we're labeling them, and we're color coding the different zones and all that stuff. So, so that's what we're looking at. So the different um, respiratory volumes that, that I mentioned this morning uh, included this first one here, shown here in blue, the smallest of the arrows called the tidal volume. When you were exhaling through the straw at rest today in lab, this is what you were exhaling, this amount of air from the, from the time you began to exhale to the time when you stopped. Okay, it's about 500 milliliters. That's the unit that respiratory volumes are measured in MLs. Now, you might know from when you took chemistry in high school or maybe today when you had to fill up the beaker, remember I said you fill it up to the 100 mil mark? So milliliters is a volumetric unit. It's a volume, it's, it's measuring liquid or it could measure air as we see here. If I was going to measure a distance, what unit might I use? Centimeters, right. inches, millimeters. <laughs> exactly, it's a totally different unit. Millimeter, one thousandth of a meter. This of course is a thousandth of a liter, which again, you buy a soft drink at the store, it's a two liter, bottle or a one liter bottle or a 750 mil bottle, right? Yeah. So I think it's, it's, my, it's helpful to know what kind of unit we're measuring these things in. The spirometer that we didn't use today, but I showed you a picture of it. And it's also shown in um, that exercise in your lab book. Remember I was telling you about this? That particular um, unit, if you look super close, it's kind of hard to see but it's cc's, which means cubic centimeter. It's the same as the milliliter unit, cc's. Okay, so if you're telling that, that patient here, you're the technician, you're saying, okay, I want you to inhale and exhale quietly, you know, breathe quietly as if you're sitting at home, or maybe she'd give him a book to read and he'd, she'd say, while you're reading this book, breathe through this. And then she would be measuring his inhalations and exhalations, his tidal volume. So he's inhaling 500 mils, then he's exhaling 500 mils, then he's inhaling 500 mils of air, and he's exhaling 500 mils. So this is at rest, quiet breathing right here, tidal volume, or TV sometimes for short, TV, tidal volume. If we asked him to take in as much air as he could above a tidal inspiration, then we'd be measuring this zone here called the inspiratory reserve volume. I'm not sure what else you'd call it. This says it all, right? It's what he has in reserve that he can bring into his lungs, i.e. inspiratory, inspiration. And you can see, wow, it's it's a lot more than the tidal volume, isn't it? I mean, if you do the math, we're talking about something a little shy of 3,000 mils, so like six times the tidal volume if you if you were to measure it. And if you think about it, you know, when you're sitting there watching me, you're not snoring, are you, John? Okay. Not putting him to sleep. If you think about, if you could take a bigger breath in. That's like five or six times what you ordinarily would inhale, right? Sitting at home, watching Zoom, whatever. So that's IRV, inspiratory reserve volume. Likewise, if the technician told the patient, at the end of a tidal exhalation, I'd like you to push as much air out of your lungs as you can. Okay. So when you get to the bottom of an exhalation, a normal, quiet, tidal exhalation, then push, push, push as much air out as you can. That would be the what? Inspiratory. 
The expiratory reserve volume? Right, the ERV, expiratory reserve. And that's right here in yellow. It's not as much as the IRV. It is, a, it is more than TV, but not a whole heck of a lot more. Maybe, maybe double, maybe. So you, your IRV is much bigger than your ERV is. When you add up the inspiratory reserve volume in red, the tidal volume in blue, and the expiratory reserve volume in yellow, that is the vital capacity, it's called. Vital capacity. This is how much air you can forcibly, voluntarily blow out of your lungs once you take the biggest possible inspiration. So if you're the technician, what you tell this patient is, okay, I want you to stand up actually and do this. Why would you tell them to stand up? Any idea? Actually, I, I would tell them to stand up for IRV or ERV measurements. Catherine. I'll so then, have four of them, okay? So then, their diaphragm can expand all the way. Right. If if you want to get the most air in your lungs as you can, or get as much air out of your lungs as you can, you want to have the biggest lung stretching, or you want to be able to take as much air in and as much air out as you can. And if you sit if you sit down, that might be a little diminished because of your sitting down. The diaphragm is kind of being artificially sort of uh, impacted in some ways. Okay, so I tell the guy to stand up and I would tell him, take a few big breaths in and out and then take the biggest possible inspiration you can and blow that out until you can't blow any more air out. Okay, so that's gonna be basically from peak inspiration right here and you blow it out, push it out, push it out, push, 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 push until you can't push out anymore and you have to inhale again. So that's red, blue, and yellow vital capacity. And those were those tables I mentioned in class, one for males, one for females, based on age and height. And then the other thing that I mentioned was this, this volume here in orange called the residual volume, which was what, do you remember? Like you always have air in your like, like somewhere in your body, like in your like trachea or something? Well, think of your respiratory tree. Remember that diagram that I, I think I alluded to? Remember the body world's example I was telling you about? Here's the respiratory tree. It's a cast of all of the passageways. It's beautiful, isn't it? Here's the trachea, here's the carina, where we split into the left primary bronchi, and here's the bronchus and the right primary bronchus, and then they subdivide into secondary and tertiary bronchi, right? Into the bronchioles eventually, tiny little bitty uh, tubes, which terminate on those clusters of microscopic air sacs, which you can't see here because you need a microscope, and those, of course, are the alveoli. So there is air trapped in all of these little tubes, some of which are bigger than others, even after you blow all the air out of your lungs, they're still air trapped. And as, as Sadie said, that's the residual volume. That's, that's what's left in your bronchial tree. It's always gonna be there. You can't, can't get rid of that unless you drowned, swallowed a bunch of air, then you wouldn't have any air in it. But hopefully that doesn't happen. So now if you were to take, let's go back to that diagram. If you were to take the vital capacity plus the air that's trapped in the lungs, that's the total lung capacity. That makes sense, right? Some of this we have conscious control over, but some of it is just trapped. It's, a, it's just a function of its trapped air. Total lung capacity. You don't need to worry about this term. You don't need to worry about that term. You can cross those out if you want. But the other ones I think are pretty easy. What term? The functional and what else? Inspiratory capacity. Uh, 
I wish we could have used the spirometers, um, but I just think given the situation, we probably shouldn't be doing that. My mom actually has one, so I was gonna try it. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom has a spirometer? Yeah, I don't know why, but she does. One of those small ones? No, it's like a big thing. It's like yeah. this big around and like, you like bone turns got like little tubes off like the side. Yeah, it's like the same yeah. thing. So was she in the hospital when she had to, she had to uh, complete some respiratory exercises before they leave her go home? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. And then she yeah. had to take it home and then like do yeah. a log. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, it's a fun little thing to play with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know, exa I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so I asked her about it because I remember it. And I was like, I think that's what we were talking about today. And then, yeah, it is. And then also in table 19.4, it like has like the equations of like all like the things like add them up. Oh, yeah. That might help someone. I was just, I noticed that. Um, Table 19.4, is this? It's right on page 749. In the book. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, it's right above the picture. Yeah, yeah, right. So I can use that then. You sure when can. When you go to add them up. Yeah, okay, I see that's, that's good. That's an, I think that might be a new add-on to this edition of the text. I don't remember seeing that because I think I would have put it on the PowerPoint. Yeah, that's very good. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't really worry about the numbers, the volumes, other than, the, other than that the, the title volume is 500. I think that's something you can remember pretty easily. But these other numbers, they can actually vary quite a bit from person to person, which you would have seen had we done and used the spirometer and done the spirometric uh, procedures. So um, yeah, don't get caught up in all the numbers except for 500, I think you should know that. That's very, very good table, Sadie. Good for you to point that out, yep. Yep. But it's basically repeating what I just described, you know. Now I'm re rewind, uh, rewinding. I am recording this class, so you can, you know, watch it again too. And you can also look at that that video that I mentioned that I did last semester on just this uh, slide. So you've got ample opportunities to to look at those if you need to do that. But you can glean it right from Table 19.4 too. It's right there. Knowing that a couple of those, again, you can omit, right? You talked about that. So Jolene, did that, did that help? Jolene is not there. Okay, well, hopefully it helped. Anything uh, else in, with regard to, to this stuff? Um, is there any way you could speak on partial pressure? Um, Absolutely. Because when I'm reading that, I don't know, something about like <laughs> yeah. just gases dissolving in blood. It's just, you know, like to me, I just picture like a carbonated blood and that's not right. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be happy to. And it's not as hard as you think it is. It's really not. So Paige is asking about partial pressures. Now, do you remember back in uh, one of the earlier chapters when we talked about diffusion? We defined that as the process of materials moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration until an equilibrium was reached. Remember that? That was way back at the very beginning of the semester. And we actually demonstrated that, I think, with um, some crystals in a petri plate of water. Do you remember when we did that? We put the rulers and we saw that diffusion take place. And then I also passed around a, a petri plate with auger in it, and it was um, a plate that had some crystal in it that it had diffused into the auger. It took like a 24 hours or more, and more, and and you all saw how it took took it some time to get into that more gelatinous kind of jello-like auger. Yep. Yeah? So just remember what diffusion is. Um, in that regard, this is talking about the movement of gases not crystals, but it's the same premise. Only here we would not use the term concentration. We would use the, the term or phrase partial pressures. But other than that, it's the same concept. So gases always move 
from higher partial pressures to lower partial pressures. Simple as that, until an equilibrium would be achieved theoretically. So how do we calculate these partial pressures that you see listed here? And there's numbers that are pointed out on some of these figures and diagrams and videos and things. Well, that's what this box in the middle kind of talks a little bit about. I don't know if you knew this, but in the air that you're breathing right now, in your office or living room or outside, the vast majority of the air that you're breathing chemically is nitrogen gas. Only 21% of the air you breathe is oxygen, O2. Did you know that? A lot of people don't know that. They would have said, oh, it's probably 98%. Well, no, not even close, right? That's here, neither here nor there. I think that's just an interesting statistic. But but that's, that's pretty much set in stone. No matter where you go on Earth, there's about 21% of the, of the, of the uh, air that you're breathing in is oxygen gas. So if we wanted to calculate the partial pressure of oxygen gas in the air we're breathing, we would have to multiply that 21% by what's called the standard atmospheric pressure. Now, again, this gets into some physics, but standard atmospheric pressure is generally thought of as 760 millimeters of mercury. And I can't get into, nor do I espouse to be a physicist, that I could explain exactly where this number comes from. But if you went to sea level, and you had a, had a machine that could measure this, <clears throat> this is the, the standard atmospheric pressure you would measure at sea level. So you'd multiply the 21%, which is 0 0.21, by 760. And if you did that math, you'd come out with 160 millimeters of mercury. So this is the unit that partial pressures are measured in, millimeters of mercury. Now, mercury, you might know, is an element. We use it in uh, a lot of our thermos thermometers, right? It expands when it gets hot, all that stuff. And this is, this is the established unit that's used to measure pressures, uh, atmospheric pressures. OK, so we are assuming some things. We're assuming standard atmospheric pressure, which can actually vary depending upon elevation and other factors, but we're going to just go with the standard atmospheric. And we know that this 21% O2 in the air is pretty much standard no matter where you go on Earth. Okay. Except underwater, then all things are off, all bets are off. But on, on the surface of the air, terrestrial ecosystems, 21% of the air is oxygen. So we would refer to the partial pressure of oxygen in the air we breathe as 160 millimeters of mercury. We denote that partial pressure with a capital P and a subscript O2. So that literally means partial pressure of oxygen. We could write the partial pressure of CO2 by putting a P and then a subscript CO2. OK, so everybody kind of get what those abbreviations refer to. The partial pressure of CO2 in the air you're breathing is really, really low because the, the, the percent of the air you're breathing is CO2. And I can't tell you exactly what that is, but we could easily calculate that. So when we talk about gas diffusion, CO2 or oxygen, we just need to know that these gases will diffuse from a higher value toward a lower value, from a higher partial pressure to a lower partial pressure. And that's what this second bullet basically just says. All right. So when we talk about, um, let's just go to a, uh, one of these. Let's see if I can find that. Oh, you know what? This is in the, um, 
I think it's in the cardiovascular system. I'm thinking about a particular diagram that I could show you. Maybe it's in respiratory. Let me let me look here real quick. I have a particular diagram. Oh yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Here we go. Let's skip ahead a little bit here. Okay. So what we're looking at here is one single alveolus. This is one of those air sacs, macroscopic air sacs lined with simple squamous. This is the terminal end of the bronchial tree, isn't it? Can't go any further than the alveoli. What this is showing and what this is showing and what this is showing a little bit of and this is showing a little bit of are cross sections through capillaries. And of course, inside we see red blood cells. No, could there be white blood cells in here and platelets in here? Of course. But we're talking about, in this case, the movement of gases. So we'll focus our attention, you know, mostly on the role that, say, uh, um, red blood cells play in transporting oxygen, you know, from the lungs to the tissues. So the point I, I guess what I, I want to make um, is the fact that when you look <clears throat> at the alveolus here and the capillary, they're both very close to one another to optimize the diffusion process okay, of these gases. And so you'll notice this respiratory membrane that I've alluded to here. This sort of gives you the impression there's just one, right? That's the, the term membrane is singular. But really, when you look closely here, there's really two membranes, isn't there? Can you tell me what the two membranes are that a gas would have to move if it went from here to here or from here to here? It's got to pass through. It'd be the wall of the capillary and the alveolus. Exactly. You've got the two walls, which are comprised of simple squamous cells. So there's really two layers that the gas would have to diffuse across. But yet, we use the term respiratory membrane to denote this. So it's a little bit confusing. But I think if you just understand, it's not one membrane. It's really two membranes. Or one could argue, yeah, we'll just say two membranes. And so here we are zooming in on that respiratory membrane. And this is, as Paige was saying, the wall of the alveolus. Here's the wall of the blood capillary. They're both simple squamous. Okay. And so what determines the diffusion of oxygen from the alveolus into the blood? What determines the diffusion of CO2 from the blood into the alveolus are simply partial pressure differences. So if I'm talking about diffusion of the oxygen from the alveolus of the lungs into the bloodstream, and that's generally where oxygen is moving, right, from the lungs into the blood, I'd have a higher partial pressure value out here than I would in here, right? And since I'm talking about the reverse movement of the CO2 now from the blood into the alveolus, which would then be exhaled, what do I know about the partial pressure of CO2 here compared to here? It's lower. Where is it lower? In the red blood cell? Nope. Oh, wait. Oh, it goes from high to low, so it'd be higher. Yeah, it'd be higher PCO2 here than in here. The, the direction of the arrow indicates the flow of the gas. So we always go from higher to lower pressure, right? So when we talk about the blood that's coming to the lungs and compare it to the blood that's leaving the lungs, getting ready to be taken to the tissues after being oxygenated, we can now begin to understand how those gases move by examining these partial pressure values. So the first thing that I'll, I'll make note of here is the fact that this is blue 
obviously, and this is red. And somewhere in between is kind of like a purple, right? Well, why is that? They just kind of wanted to make it colorful? No. Why is this blue? And don't say because your blood is blue, because it's really not blue. Because it's not oxygenated. Well, um, I'm going to say technically not true. Although <laughs> it's... It's really not fair to say that the blood is not oxygenated because if you look here, Paige, look at the PO2 of this blood, this blue blood, is it zero? No. No, it's 40, okay? So better yet, a better way to say that might be to say that the blue indicates oxygen poor blood. Now, I will tell you, and I'll be brutally honest, I would have answered it probably the same way you did because I was taught blue is deoxygenated, red is oxygenated. That's how I learned it from the very beginning. But when I started to teach this and study it, I thought to myself, we should not be using those terms. I mean, I get why we use them because most people don't go into this detail and knowledge, but, but we're all going into nursing or whatever. And so we wanna make sure we understand that the blood coming into your lungs that is dark red, purple, it's dark, dark colored. It is not devoid of oxygen. It has oxygen in it. So let's, let's redefine it as oxygen poor blood. Okay, minor, minor point, but an important point, I think. Well, it, I mean, it makes sense because that's probably why people can, you know, still survive for a couple of minutes if they, you know, lack oxygen or whatever. Yeah. But, but there's a major misconception among the general public because if you were to ask people who've studied this in high school, let's say, or whatever, and you say blue blood, they would say the same thing you did. And that is oxygen uh, or deoxygenated blood. But we're going we're gonna to redefine it as oxygen poor blood. If that's oxygen poor blood, then what are we going to call this? Simply... Oxygen rich blood. Oxygen rich blood. Exactly. That's exactly what we should call it. Oxygen rich blood. Yep. Yep. Because look at the PO2 here. And look at the PO2 coming in. Wow. We go from 40 to 104. That's a big jump in oxygenation, isn't it? Well, why? Because we know where's oxygen going here. From the alveolus across the respiratory membrane into the blood. Look at the PO2 of the alveolus. The air or the oxygen concentration in the alveoli, 104. What is it in the incoming oxygen poor blood? 40, right? Right, look at the numbers. So if my question to you is, how much O2 will move into the blood from the alveolus how high can the PO2 go here? How high can we go? From 40 up to what? 104. Yeah, because it says this, but why? Because we cannot exceed the PO2 in the alveolus. It's, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's impossible to go anything higher than this. Well, we can, we can get to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a physics thing, it's physics. Look at the PCO2 of the incoming oxygen poor blood, 45 millimeters of mercury. What is the PCO2 in the alveolus? It's not zero, is it? It's 40. Well, how much CO2 can diffuse out? How low can we push the PCO2 once gas exchange has occurred? Only 40. as low as what? 40. Right, 40. We can't go any lower than the PCO2 in the alveolus. So here's the ex exiting blood, oxygen-rich blood. But look, does it have CO2 in it? The answer is yes. Did you know that? I'll bet you assume the blood leaving the lungs was devoid of carbon dioxide, that we got rid of all of it. Here you now know we get rid of some of it, but we retain some PCO2 in the oxygen-rich blood. That is that's, that has to be. 
we don't want this to fall too low. Otherwise, we run, in, we run into problems physiologically. We can die if our PCO2 gets too low, believe it or not. And that's a whole nother lecture, but but you're, on, you're just kind of getting exposed to some basic principles here. So that was a long explanation, um, Paige, but did that help kind of give you an idea of partial pressures, what those meant and kind of how it works? It's really pretty in interesting and easy if you just kind of get the concept of gas is always diffused from higher partial pressures to lower partial pressures. And of course, this process, as we see, is occurring at the lung level because we have the respiratory membrane shown here, which is really two membranes, the wall of the alveolus and the wall of the blood capillary. Does that make sense? Anything you want me to review on that? I don't think it's critical that you memorize these numbers, if that's what you're wondering. But I think you should understand the fact that we have a higher PCO2 of blood coming in than we do leaving. And we have a higher PO2 of the blood leaving than we do coming in. And that that gas exchange process and how hard those numbers can fall or rise are really dependent upon the PCO2 and PO2 levels in the alveoli. It's the PCO2 and the PO2 in the alveoli that determine these, or the, well, anyway, determine this value of the outgoing blood. Now you have to, again, understand that the blood coming into the lungs is coming from the right ventricle. We haven't talked about the heart yet, but we will very, very soon. The heart is a pump. It pumps the blood, the deoxygen, or the oxygen poor blood, ultimately to the lungs so it can be oxygenated and then this blood is returned back to the heart so that it can be pumped to the rest of the body. So, any questions on, on this stuff? Um, so we'll open it up. Other other topics you'd like to talk about? You're not sure about? It's confusing. So we're good on respiratory system. Anything you want to ask about there? Um, we could, you know, talk about blood stuff if you want. I don't know, again, if you've even gotten into that chapter, but. So I started on the blood chapter and I'm kind of getting the feeling that some of that is going to play a big role in the lymphatic system. Is that, are those two kind of going to build off each other a bit? Um, they will, as it pertains to um, white blood cells, certain white blood cells that play a role in fighting infection. And uh, in particular, we'll talk about um, macrophages, which are actually monocytes that leave the bloodstream and go out into the tissues. Um, and we'll also talk a lot about T and B lymphocytes. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so a little bit of chapter uh, 14 will spill off into chapter 16 um, as it pertains specifically to uh, immune cells, certain white blood cells. Yeah.
the, the blood chapter basically surveys the, uh, the formed elements, which are the red cells, white cells, and platelets. It's kind of funny that they use that, that term formed element. I'm not sure where that came from, but uh, whenever you see that, just remember those are the, the cells. The formed elements are the, the red cells, uh, white cells, and the platelets. And so this chapter just kind of goes through each of those major cell types. It gives you some statistics about you know typical cell counts. And then it goes into like, what do these cells pretty much do? How is their, um, their formation regulated? They talk specifically about a hormone called erythropoietin. The other day in review, uh, I, I remember you know Jolene and John and I think Freya were there. We were we were talking about blood doping, and Sadie, you were there too, um, and how athletes oftentimes, um, well, not oftentimes, but some athletes have been caught illegally. Um, doping it's called um they they uh either receive blood transfusions right before a competition or they'll re they'll get an, uh, an infusion a blood transfusion of um erythropoietin an artificial hormone that causes their bone marrow to make more red cells now why would you want to have more red blood cells in your body well think about it less fatigue because then you have more oxygen going to your muscles right you have an increased oxygen carrying capacity. So you can deliver more oxygen to the muscles and deliver, you know, allow those cells to undergo aer aerobic respiration to form the CO2 or form the ATP. You were a little garbled there. I think you're in your car, aren't you? Um, so they, they talk about this there on figure 14.6. Let's see here. Okay, come on here, share, share. Let's see if I can find that diagram. Uh, here it is. Yeah. So this talks about a particular hormone called erythropoietin that your liver and kidneys produce. And it results in the formation of more red blood cells. So if you take artificial EPO, um, then you're artificially causing an increase in your RBC count. You can perform more optimally from an athletic point of view than somebody who doesn't have as many red blood cells in their body. Um, you know, today we can measure this. Athletes have to have blood draws done before and after competitions so they can, they can monitor this. It's just unfortunate that in today's world, we got to do all this chemical testing of our athletes because they're under a great deal of pressure to perform and to win and to get medals and to make endorsements and to make money so they can live in Beverly Hills and be rich and on TV all the time. <laughs> or somebody who's playing football or hockey or baseball feels the need to do this so they can make a name for themselves. It's all ego, it's all money, it's all, all that bologna sausage. And it's just a sad commentary on our culture I would argue, and I'm, I'm getting off topic a little bit, but it does have uh, physiologic relevance here in this sense and can make for some interesting conversation, right, with people. But this has been going on for decades and decades and decades. And, and uh, just as soon as they find a way of detecting certain illicit drugs or hormones, um, whoever does this will come up with a different way of trying to hide the detection of the hormone. You know, it, it's just like a tit for tat. They're, you're always trying to stay a step ahead of your opponent kind of thing. It's just, I just think it's really sad <laughs> that we've come to that, but it is what it is. Anyway, this is a really, really excellent um, negative feedback loop 
That's what we're talking about here, right? So for example, um, let's say you go to Denver or you go out backpacking in the West at a higher elevation. Well, the air is thinner. And so if you're trying to, um, let's say backpack, I, I can speak um, from experience here. I did a lot of backpacking in college and we used to go out to uh, Colorado a lot and do a lot of hiking and fishing and such, such. And we would drive all night long through Iowa and, and Nebraska and into Eastern Colorado. And uh, we get there at the trailhead the next day after driving all night, you know, we're like 21, 22. So we're like, it doesn't bother us to drive all night. But you get there and you start hiking and you're at, uh, you know, Denver is mile high city, right? So what is that? How many feet in a mile? 5,000 plus, I forget the number. I used to remember it. Anyway, I'm used to being at 700 feet, you know, Olean or where you guys live. You're, you're probably somewhere in the 700 to 800 foot elevation. Imagine going up eight times that height, you know, or seven. So the air's thinner up there. And I can remember the first few days of backpacking um, and it wasn't like, we spent a few hours hiking, but I felt physically sick. I was so exhausted. Oh, I will never forget that. And it was because my body wasn't used to the thin air and I was still hiking. I had a heavy, you know, 60 pound backpack and all that stuff. It took me about a week before I felt that I wasn't totally wiped out after two or three hours of hiking. So what my body was doing was it was recognizing the low blood oxygen level that I was experiencing at 7,000, 8,000 feet in Colorado. And these two organs were producing this hormone. So this is an endocrine hormone, gets into the bloodstream, gets taken all over the place. But what, what of course is the target tissue here? Well, it's the red bone marrow, right? And it's here that the that the formed elements are produced. The white cells, red cells, and platelets are all made here. And we talk about that at the beginning here of chapter uh, 14. So my red blood cells are being produced in higher concentration and in, in a, in a greater frequency because of the effect of EPO on the marrow. As soon as these blood cell counts rise and my oxygen carrying capacity gets higher, is there the need to crank out as much EPO? The answer is no, it's negative feedback. So there's less and less of this being produced as my oxygen carrying capacity rises to meet the needs of my body. Yeah. Now there is a danger, getting back to blood doping, if you have a blood transfusion, so you're getting the blood cells right away, right? You're not having to make it. So if you get artificial EPO, you can have this put in your body a week or two before you compete, and then you build it up naturally. But if you can't wait or you need a sudden influx or they're doing the blood testing um, yesterday and I'm competing on Friday, I'm going to get this transfusion on Thursday. All right. What that does is it the, the downside of too many blood cells, blood cells in your body is it causes the blood to thicken and that can affect blood pressure. It can have all sorts of potential deleterious impacts on your health, believe it or not. It, it can be a bit dangerous to do. So this is always done under the guidance of a physician. Well, granted, he shouldn't, he or she shouldn't be doing this. This is, we'll figure it illegal, right? But people will do anything for money. Make sure you have a physician. Um, if, you guys, if you guys blood dope, have a physician help you do that. Because <laughs> well, like people that like, you know. um, people that like um, hike like Mount Everest, yeah, is okay. it illegal for them to get like a blood transfusion? Because wouldn't they need like the oxygen? When you climb Mount Everest, don't you use like an oxygen tank too? Oh man, when you get above, the death zone is called. I watched a, a series of shows on this not too long ago, so I can speak to this. It was fascinating to follow these climbers and what they had to do. It, it is a very, very dangerous thing to climb on Everest okay. because you get to a level, an, an altitude, where if you don't have supplemental oxygen on, you have a high risk of dying. So at that point, it, it wouldn't do you any good 
to 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 illegally try to get get this. No. It, in fact, what they do is they spend two weeks at a base camp, which is like close to 20,000 feet. Now, I don't know if you know, Everest is like oh, 29,000, oh, what is it, 800 feet? I forget. Somebody Google it if you could. I can look it up too, but I'll, you're faster than me. That is that is an extremely high elevation. You can't get any higher than Everest, right? The air is so thin that you've got to be on the supplemental oxygen. And when you go from the highest base camp to to um, to ascend um, Everest and you come down, all this is done in the day. You leave early in the morning, like at two in the morning, and you come you come back down that same day. What's the elevation, Sadie? Uh, twenty nine thousand thirty two. Okay, twenty nine thousand thirty two. So a little for twenty nine thousand feet. Um, you got to do that in a day because if you stay up there, you will die. That's how dangerous it is. And that's not even taking into account the temperature, the winds. Oh my gosh. It is, that show was absolutely the most interesting show. You can, you can go on HBO. If you guys, any of you have, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, not pay-per-view, um, uh, on demand. Uh, HBO on demand, go check it out. I think it's called Everest something or other. It is absolutely the most interesting show. I forget what season it was, but they follow these hikers all the way from the beginning to the end. And it's just absolutely astounding. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing what what goes through their bodies when they undergo that process. It's, it's scary. It's super scary. So you gotta you gotta be in pretty darn good shape to do this. Now I remember one guy, he wanted to ascend Everest without supplemental oxygen. He did not do it. He was a 28 year old guy. He's in pretty good shape. He'd done a lot of mountains uh, in Europe, but Everest is in a different world. Totally different world. Anyway, I I uh, got off topic a bit. Interesting. We've got a few minutes left. Anything else you want to kind of focus on? You definitely want to get into the blood chapter, you know, by the end of this week. And as long as I think about it, as I was saying in, in lab today, for next Wednesday, let me um, pull up the cardiovascular system. Comes my friendly conductor, the guy with the horn fetish. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cardiovascular. Where are you? All right. Come on, cardiovascular, where is it? I don't know why it's not showing here. Okay, hang on a minute. I'm not sure if this is going to work or not. Is is cardiovascular coming up? Yeah. Okay, it's going to just take a second to load. Again, it's a fairly large chapter. 
Now, a lot of slides, by the way, in this PowerPoint, um, as you'll see if you scroll down. Um, okay, so there's 115 slides in this chapter, so that's a lot of slides. So um, it's starting here on basically slide number seven that I introduced the heart, you know, a little bit about its size and what it looks like inside a cadaver. And, and then we get into some of the anatomy. So ideally, and I know this is asking a lot, but ideally, if you can get through Oh, if you can get through slide up to through slide 31, not they have to know everything there is to know about those slides. I'm not saying that, but but at least watch some of these these videos and and study, especially like this flow chart. Well, I can't see it. Okay, so let's reshare. Okay, how about now? Okay, we got it. Okay, so yeah, better. yeah, sorry. So um, this is a slide 31, and it has a, a nice little video that you know, will take you through the heart, and and actually it's like a fly through. It's kind of cool. Um, this is the flow chart that I was mentioning a moment ago, that that uh, John was saying you guys couldn't see. Do you remember um, we talked in? Um, the muscle chapter, we had pointed out some some uh, different structures, um, working our way down into the actin and the myosin filaments. We started off like in the broader muscle, then we talked about fascicles and muscle fibers and filaments. Remember, it was kind of a logical listing. Now, that was just more of an organizational schematic. This is a this is a physical. This is where blood flows from here to here to here to here to here to here to here. So this is anatomical, describing blood flow. If you can get to this point, then the dissection that we do on Wednesday is going to just make for a more meaningful experience. If you can, if you can get some comfortable uh, feeling about the chambers of the heart, the flow of the blood through the heart, where is the tricuspid valve? Where's the bicuspid valve? Where's the aortic and semi and pulmonary semilunar valves? Um, that's really going to help uh, hugely um, for the dissection, because it's going to be impossible for me to teach the heart anatomy in lab in, in in a half hour or so without just causing your head to spin like Linda Blair on The Exorcist. You know, it's just not going to be a good sight. <laughs> so do your best try to, to look over these um, slides I, I, I put them in in a nice you know logical order so I'm bouncing around here on, on this particular sharing but uh, but it, it's all here just take some time look through this this will be really helpful especially you know like from say slide 14 through slide 31 you know there there you go 14 to 31 look at those slides and when you get to the heart um focus on those terms that i've put in kind of uh, you know the blue highlighted box or the yellow highlighted box there's other terms here that we'll you know we'll talk more about um in the chapter two but I'd like you to get a little comfortable with the anatomy of the heart, chambers, the valves, and blood flow. And at first, it looks a little bit confusing, a little daunting. It's really not bad. It's just plumbing. That's all it is, plain old plumbing. Cardiac surgeons are nothing more than overpaid plumbers. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Plumbers make good money, right? But not like a cardiovascular surgeon, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any last minute questions? 
All right. Well, I will see you in review Tuesday. Um, have a great rest of the week. Yeah, you too. Okay. Thanks. Bye.